to go? Good to go, baby. Matt. good to be able to come together with you this morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody watching online. Uh, welcome, everybody here in person. We're glad to be able to be together. Uh, just as we were singing there, like, you're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. And I just want everybody just to close your eyes, and I want you to think of a time when you felt weak and you felt God defending you or you felt God's comfort when you were weak. God, we thank you for that comfort that you give us. We thank you for the ways that you defend us. We thank you for your goodness to us. Not because we've earned it, but because you are good, because you are loving God. And I pray that we would really be worshiping you in that this morning, God. Um, thank you for this group that you've brought together today. 
Um, and may we truly worship you. May we, as we prayed earlier with the worship team, God, may we just submit ourselves to you today. And may we just see the power of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Order because usually I pray and then we go back into worship. But I was just as as we were thinking, I was just reflecting on that. And I just wanted to encourage us to kind of reflect on what we're actually singing and thinking about. You know, we talked a few weeks ago about worship and that we worship comes from response to who God is and what God and to God's presence. And so, just encourage us to really let our minds be drawn there and let uh, like let God's Spirit flow and and just respond to Him in worship this morning. So that's my encouragement to us. I don't have any announcements to announce. Um, so let's just move back into worship time and, and let God work. Thank you, Justin. We're going to invite you to stand with us once again. Let's pour.
God holds you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised. any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him in the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God's word here says that, that every knee will bow, every tongue confess. So I just encourage us this morning just to reflect, to, re to bow your knee to Jesus this morning. Is he really Lord and King of your life? Have you really turned everything over to him? Are you really worshiping him above all other idols? Take a minute and bow your knee before God, before Jesus this morning.
it also says that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And not big on like groups repeating things and everything, but I think there is power in just making that confession together. And so let's just speak out together that Jesus Christ is Lord. So say it with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. It's one more time. Jesus Christ is Lord. God, we declare Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. He is Lord of this earth. He is Lord of creation. God, that, that Jesus Christ has come to retake what our sin, what death and evil and sin has, has, has been taken from your dominion. Jesus Christ came to retake it, and he did it in a way that we would never expected with his death and his resurrection. And so we declare him Lord this earth. We declare him Lord of our lives. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to worship by giving this morning, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Uh, I think everybody's probably aware of that, unless you're watching online at home, so you can just look at that if you're wanting to give from home. Um, and let's go ahead and dismiss kids for Kids Church. So walking through seven into the prime, or no, I got it wrong. Walking through, I'm sorry, preschool through second grade in the primary room, and third through fifth grade in the youth room. All right, so um, we're continuing today. Um, as, uh, rather than going through a book of the Bible, we, we've been talking about our values. What are our values as a church? Um, as eldership, we kind of discussed and looked at who we are and who we feel God has called us to be and, and identified these five different values. Um, and so the first uh, one that we had talked about was worship, that we praise God in his glory and greatness, both in our meeting together and by honoring him in all aspects of our lives. We talked about last week about a uh, mission that we share the good news of Jesus Christ with our neighbors and our community uh, and support those sharing that good news around the world. And then this, this week, um, we're going to move on and, uh, and we're going to talk about compassion. And as I said, these are not like in any like top down order that we said that worship, that really if we're worshiping that, that all of these other values flow out of worship. Um, but uh, but uh, we uh, but as far as the rest of values go, it's not like that, that, that we're saying like one is better than the other, but these are all things, all aspects of, of who God has made us to be as a church and who God has called us to be as a church. And so um, we talked about compassion in this way that we continue the ministry of Jesus, showing the good news of God's kingdom to the least of this world. And once again, I don't really want to preach from the value of our statement. I really want to preach from God's word. And as we, we talk about that, then you'll see you know, the, the, the value reflected in that as well. So um, uh, uh, why is this a value for us? And I, and I think before we get into that, I want to start the little activity here. I want you to think of three to five words that, that, to describe yourself. Like if someone asks you, asks you to describe yourself in three to five words, um, what words you pick? I want you to share with the people around you what three to five words you'd pick to describe yourself. All right, anybody want to share some of your 
your words. Rod, what do you got? What words did you say? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay. Nice. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's always hard to judge how much time to give when you're up here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Wendy, you guys want, you want to share for your family? No? <laughs> Inventive. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody, anybody else want to share? If I, oh, yeah, Logan, let's hear it. I got energetic. I oh, I'm pro crafter. Nice. Oh, okay. Nice. Awesome. Those are good words. I I I thought for me, I'd I'd pay, say kind, funny, and hairy. Uh, yeah. All right. So so the reason I want to start with this um, is because there's a place in Scripture where God does what we just did, where He describes Himself in just a few words and describes. Um, who he is. And so um, it's, it's a place we should be familiar with if you've been attending BCF for a while, because um, it's from Exodus. We, we went through the book of Exodus a few years ago, um, and it's on Mount Sinai. So there's this story. So if you remember, uh, the story of Exodus is that the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and God rescues them out of Egypt, uh, brings them across the Red Sea, brings them to Mount Sinai, establishes a covenant with his people, leads them through Moses, and Moses uh, goes up on top of Mount Sinai. And at one part in the book of Exodus, uh, God says, I'm going to proclaim my name to you. And the, and the name of God, Yahweh, is kind of a theme in the book of Exodus, God revealing himself um, and, and what, uh, who he is, and not just his name, Yahweh, like, hi, my name's Yahweh, uh, how are you? But like, what that means, you know, what that name embodies and everything. And so there's this, this place in the book of Exodus where, where God goes up, um, and he's proclaiming his name to Moses. And so in Exodus 34, 6, it says, uh, Then Yahweh came down in a cloud and stood there with him. And he called out his name, Yahweh, and Yahweh passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. It goes on from there, um, but I wanted to focus on this first part here. So um, if, you, if you don't remember, I'll just say it because I say it from time to time because I do it a lot. Whenever you see the Lord, all capitals, it's really in, in Hebrew, it's the name of God, Yahweh. And that's why we read it that way is because I think it brings out a richness um, and a relational aspect of God um, when we read it that way. And so that's why we do it. So obviously here, too, he's saying he's not saying I'm Yahweh, the Lord. I'm Yahweh, Yahweh, like he's, he's emphasizing his name. But what's, uh, where I really want to focus on today when we're talking about our values and why is compassion of value to us is we see that the very first word that God uses to describe himself is a God of compassion. That God is a God of compassion. And so right away, we see that compassion is a defining characteristic of God. That God himself is identifies compassion as, as one of the chief characteristics of who he is, of what it means to be Yahweh, that Yahweh is a God of compassion, right? If someone says to us, uh, and I, I think this is interesting, because if someone says to us, you know, what is God like, or if we're describing God to someone, I think oftentimes we jump towards like love, um, maybe just, all-powerful, all-knowing, and all those things are true of God. Those are all biblical ideas of God. But it's interesting, when God chooses to describe himself, he begins with compassion. And so when we, it's, we talk about why is this a value at BCF, we say, well, because it's a value to God. It's a value of who God is. Um, so, um, so, so that's why compassion is a value. But then what exactly is compassion? And so I wanted to, I, uh, I kind of spent some time this week like looking biblically, what is compassion? And once again, I looked at the words, you know, trying to go back to like the Hebrew words and the Greek words that, that are used for compassion. And there's, there's three main words throughout scripture that are used. There's one word in Hebrew that's used and, 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 and two in the Greek 
it's used. And, and so this word in Hebrew, this word that is the word that God uses here in this passage of, of Exodus, it's really interesting. If you look at the root form of the word of, uh, uh, and what it all ties back to, it, it comes from the root of the Hebrew word for a womb. A womb. Now, what happens in a womb? New life? Uh-huh. Uh, life? A, a baby gets what? A baby gets formed, yeah. And why is a womb important for a baby? It provides the baby nourishment, protection, right? It provides, it helps to provide for the baby for all the things that it's not able to provide for itself, right? And, and, and the hope is that it grows into, a, you know, a fully formed, uh, well, eventually fully formed adult that's able to, to sustain itself. But in this time, uh, when, it's, uh, when the baby's in the womb, it, it's, it's getting its needs met. It's being provided for in a way that it is unable to provide for itself. And so when we're, we're asking, you know, what is compassion in a biblical sense? I think one thing we see about the compassion is compassion is caring for others in ways that they may not be able to care for themselves. Compassion is caring for others in ways not able to care for themselves. We're, we're wombing them. We're caring for them. Uh, in a way to meet their needs that they are unable to meet on their own, right? Those, those needs might be financial, there might be mental health, there might be education, trauma, tragedy. There's all sorts of things that those needs might come, be or stem from, but we are meeting people's needs in a way that they're not able to themselves. And we see that this is a defining characteristic of God. This is what God does, right? He, he meets the needs of his people. In the Exodus story, he's bringing his people out of slavery. He's meeting that need of, of freedom that they need, that need of worship that they, they, they have. He's, he's meeting that. He's meeting that need of, of, of covenant, of, of relationship with them. Like He's meeting all sorts of needs that they're not able to meet for themselves. We see that, that God does that throughout, throughout our lives, right? That, that, that he provides us, he meets our needs of, of, uh, uh, and, uh, that we are not able to provide for ourselves of, of uh, forgiveness, of the release of guilt, of, of, of companionship, of purpose, that, that he meets those needs for us in ways that we are not able to ourselves. Compassion is, meet, is caring for others in a way that they are not able to. To care for themselves. All right, so that's a, the first word that's used scripturally. Um, the second one um, is, is an interesting one. It's a, it's a synonym um, for mercy, and a good example of this comes from, so from Luke 6, 27, so from the teachings of Jesus, and he says, but you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the, uh, of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. So this is a well-known teaching of Jesus to love your enemies, um, to, to, not, uh, to, to, to treat them well, even when they don't deserve it. Treat them well, even when they haven't earned it. Um, to, to still care for them, to, 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 to love them. Um, but, but Jesus specifically ties this to compassion, right? You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. I think a lot of times when we talk about compassion, we think of compassion and we think of meeting those needs that others aren't able to meet for themselves. We think, um, well, I, I want to be compassionate to people, but a lot of times, you know, people have made their choices. They've made their decisions. They, uh, they, they really deserve what they're getting. They really deserve the state that they're in. Um, and so I don't really need to be compassionate. I really want to, the people I want to be compassionate to are the people that are working hard and, you know, just can't get out, uh, you know, can't catch a break or something like that. And what, what uh, this, this passage reminds us of, and when we look at this word that's used for compassion, the Greek here, the, this word that's kind of like mercy, is that, that, um, uh, that, that, that it's not just about the worth of, well, not the worth, but the, uh, the worthiness of the person that we show compassion to, but we show compassion 
because we are God's people. We show compassion because God is in his very nature compassionate. And so we are called to be compassionate in our nature too, right? And he, and he says there that, that, that God is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Who here has been unthankful to God before? Who here has been wicked before? Who has, who has still experienced God's compassion and kindness? Right? And so what this verse reminds us of is uh, when it comes to compassion, we don't show people compassion because of, of, of the, that they have earned it. We show others compassion because God showed us grace. We show others compassion because uh, God showed us grace. When we see that homeless person, when we see that, that person who's obviously struggling with addiction, when we see uh, the, the, the person who keep, seems to just keep making poor choices in life, do we reflect on their unworthiness? Do we reflect on their dirtiness? Do we reflect on their, uh, their unhealthiness? Do we reflect on all of that? Or do we reflect on there but for the grace of God go I? that I am just as capable of being where they are as they are. They are, and I, I am just as wicked and far removed from God, and he showed me grace and love, and so I need to show them grace and love and compassion. Compassion does not see the, the choices that people made as a barrier to love, but in fact can be a, a reason to love them. Right? God loves us despite our wickedness. God loves us despite our bad choices. God loves us despite the ways that we have hurt, not just ourselves, but others. God loves us and shows us grace. And we are called to show, them that, to show others that too. My mom used to, uh, told me a story, you know, you know those the stories that your parents tell you so much that you just remember and you feel like you were there even though it was like they happened before you were born? So one of those stories for me is uh, my mom told me, so um, my, uh, my mom became a Christian like shortly after my parents divorced. Um, and so that indirectly led to me, you know, growing up in church and becoming a Christian, obviously, as well. So, uh, but, but prior to that, uh, uh, sorry, I don't need to get a lot of backstory, but prior to that, she had a friend uh, when, when they lived on the island of Crete, um, who was a Christian woman who actually had a huge influence. And my mom's actually sad that she's never been able to, to share that with, with this woman that she actually ended up becoming a Christian largely because of this woman's influence. So that's just a good reminder to, to, to know that even if you don't see the fruits of your labor, that, that doesn't mean that, that it's not at work. But that's not the point of this story. Um, so one time she was out, I think, shopping or something with this woman, and they, they were walking by a, a homeless person. I believe that the person was like kind of obviously drunk, um, and and the, this Christian woman that was my, my mom's friend stopped and gave uh, money and, like, talked to him a little bit. And as they're walking away, my mom's like, why would you give him money? You know, he's just going to go spend it on alcohol. And, and her friend's response was, um, well, what he does with that money is between him and God. Uh, what I do with my money is between me and God, right? In other words, I am called as a, as a follower of Christ to be compassionate. I am called as a follower of Christ to show grace and love to others. I'm giving that person an opportunity to respond in obedience to God. Now, I think there's, you know, there's, there's times like uh, oftentimes if I see someone that's in that situation, I'll try to maybe get them food or, or water, you know, give them some sort of basic need. And I, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, but, but if we have the mentality that I'm not willing to help someone because of what I think their choices that they have made in their life are or what I think the choices they will make are, then I wonder if we're really recognizing and, 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 and showing and living out the grace of God that he has shown us to them, right? Compassion begins with a recognition of the compassionate character of God and the grace that he's shown to us and then lives out in showing that grace to others. All right, so that's the, the first two words there. Um, there's one more word in Greek that's used for compassion, um, this is one that we talked about when we went through the book of Matthew. Um, we're going to look at Mark uh, and everything. Oh, no, this is Matthew, sorry. Uh, from the book of Matthew, so this is Matthew 9, 35, and it says, Jesus traveled through the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
And so it says, Jesus, so, so um, you know, one of the things here is he says that he was announcing the good news. We talked last week about our mission to announce the good news. And then it directly ties the announcing of the good news with Jesus healing, meeting the needs, like healing people who aren't able to, uh, 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 helping their needs in ways that they aren't able to help or care for themselves. So that compassion piece is, is, is tied into that announcement of the good news that we announce the good news with our words and we show the good news with our compassion. Um, and then it specifically says that when he saw them, he had compassion on them. And I think this word is, is one of the most interesting. You may remember when we talked about it when we went through the book of Matthew. Um, and I'm not trying to be crass here, uh, but the, the word here is gutted, um, right? And I know we use the word gutted like in a different way, but, but, it, but in Greek, it's like literally like you feel it in your gut. And I was thinking about this, and once again, I'm not trying to be crass, but have you ever had, like, gas that's, like, trapped in your stomach, and it's, like, it won't come out, and, then, and it just, like, kind of boils in you and just, like, kind of doubles you over, and you just feel that pain kind of deep in you, right? I, uh, like, it's, it's, like, a kind of a miserable experience, right, that you feel that, but I was thinking about that in relation to this, this word gutted is just that, that I think that the idea is that Jesus felt that pain in a deep way inside of him. Like as he encountered people in need, as he encountered people who weren't able to care for themselves, as he encountered um, hurt and heartache and trauma and pain and, and poverty and addiction, as he encountered all these things in, his, in the, the world around him, he felt this deep, visceral reaction deep inside him. And that was his compassion, that he was so able to identify with the needs of others. And so that's the third thing we see about compassion is that compassion identifies with the needs of others. We feel their pain. We hurt when they hurt. We identify with what they are going through. Compassion just doesn't, doesn't see uh, people. I think oftentimes another mistake we can make with compassion is we kind of see, um, oh, well, look at their choices, and they're kind of down there, and I'm up here, and I'm going to give from, from my place of privilege, I'm going to give from my place of, of, of specialness, I'm going to give uh, to them um, a, a, in a way that can be demeaning to people. And I don't think that compassion is demeaning in any way. Compassion identifies with the people. It shares their pain. It enters into it, right? Jesus was not demeaning to people in any way, even though he is the king. He's the name above all names. He wasn't demeaning in his approach to people. He came and identified with them, right? Oftentimes, uh, you know, I've talked about this before. Uh, oftentimes with people we encounter, what they need most isn't our financial gift, isn't uh, our, our um, you know, material gift. What they need most is friendship, someone who cares, someone who will interact with them. Right? You want to, you, maybe you, you, you're, uh, you're like my mom and you're like, I, I want to give to that person because I'm worried they might use it uh, for drugs. Maybe you can just give your time to them. Just stop and have a conversation with them. That's a way that we can give and show compassion, is by identifying with others. Uh, I need a volunteer up here. All right, Logan, I saw your hand first. Come on up, bud. I think you had to do this last time I did a similar type of illustration. All right, put this on, bud. <laughs> Got it? How does that feel? Yeah, you're so strong. Look, yeah. Oh, look at those muscles. How would you feel if you had to carry that around all day, Logan? Oh, yeah, take a lap around the room. <laughs> Could you do it all day? I am going to need you to come back up here for the purpose of this illustration at some point. <laughs> so, so Logan's going around. He's lugging his burden around all day. And I see Logan, and my heart goes out to him. And I was like, that looks like a big uh, burden. I know Logan's strong, but that looks like a big burden to carry. And so I go up to Logan, and I say, Logan, I am so sorry that you're bearing this burden. This must be really hard. You know, let me pray for you, and then send him on his way. Is that, is that really helping Logan? Yes. No. What if I do this? Oh, Logan, what if I say, you know what? You're bearing a huge burden here. Let me help you out. Can... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some of your burden for you. Here, you take that one. There you go, and I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, so much easier, so much faster now, Logan. Oh! <laughs> All right. That's, that. <laughs> you okay, bud? Are you okay, Logan? 
<laughs> All right, thanks, buddy. Everybody give Logan a hand. Thank you, Logan. So the point of that is that oftentimes um, we, we, we say we want to help people and everything. And, um, you know, and, I, and I said something about prayer in there. It's not that prayer is not important. Prayer is powerful. Prayer can affect things. Prayer can change things, and, and prayer is something we absolutely should do um, with people and, and when we see people in need. But I think oftentimes we can use prayer as a way to not really share or relieve their burden in a meaningful, uh, not that prayer is in a meaningful way, but in a practical way, we'll say, right? That we don't just pray. pray prayer is a super important part of that, but that we also are willing to, to help bear their burden in another way. way. Oops. <laughs> Man, Logan, this illustration is not going well for us, huh? <laughs> uh, that, that we are able to, to meet their burden in, in, in a practical way as well, right? That, that we, when we look at Jesus, he didn't just go um, and, and say to people, well, be better, be better. But Jesus went and identified people. He went and identified in a way that, that was costly, that was burdensome to him. If you've, if you've seen the, the show, The Chosen, I, I've talked about it a few times. One of the episodes I really liked there is there's an episode where Jesus is kind of out healing and working with people and with the crowds all day, and his disciples are back and everything. It's about their interaction. But my favorite part of it was at the very end, Jesus comes back, and he's just like weary. He's tired. He's aching just because he's been out there with the people. He's been out there loving the people. He's been out there identifying with the people, right? When we talk about showing compassion, I think we're, we're like, oh, yeah, I want to show compassion, but we're, we want to do it in ways that don't really uh, burden us too much, right? I'm willing to, to give as much as I have to give. I'm willing to, uh, to, to give as, uh, my time as long as it doesn't really interfere with the things that I really want to do. Uh, Jonathan Edwards uh, was, uh, saw in his town a need for compassion and preached a lot on it. And one of the things he said is he said, if we're never obliged to relieve others' burdens, but only when we can do it without burdening ourselves, then how do we bear our neighbor's burdens when we bear no burden at all? Right? In other words, like if we're only willing to help when, we don't, when it doesn't cost us, when we don't bear a burden, how are we really bearing one another's burdens the way that we're supposed to? Compassion identifies with people in a way that was willing to cost us something, that's willing to, 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 for us to give of something of value to us, whether it's our time, whether it's our money, whether it's our relation, relational or emotional, um, uh, our, our emotionality, you guys get what I'm trying to say with that, right? It, we, that we give in a meaningful way that costs us something. That is truly compassion. When we tried this all back, we said, you know, God, God is a God of compassion. God is a God of compassion because he gives in a way that costs him something, right? He gave even his only son to us. We are called to be compassionate in a way that can be difficult and hard. So those are, those are, that, that's what I think compassion is from a biblical perspective. Um, a few challenges to that. So, so if this is a value of BCF, you know, how do we do that? And I think as we, as we came together as eldership, you know, I said that, that some of these values are things that, that we see at work and the congregation that God, of people that God has brought together. And some of these things are things that we just feel we're called to be as a church in general. And I think this is definitely one of those things we, we see at work in our congregation. This is something I think that um, our church as a, as a church has a heart of compassion, that there's a lot that we do, I think, in this realm that, that, that I feel... Um, proud of, not in like a boastful way, but proud of as a church that, that, that I feel that we do this well. So um, how do we do this? Well, one thing is we just, if we just look at how we spend our, our money. So in the last year, uh, in 2021, we spent $7,500 um, in compassion uh, giving. Now, this is a little confusing because we have an actual fund called the Compassion Fund that's specifically for people in our congregation that are going through hard times. And so this is not just the Compassion Fund, but this is the Compassion Fund. This is the benevolence and helping others out in the community. Um, we support uh, the community assistance program financially, uh, $150 every month. So this is all of those things all kind of added together. And actually, last year, which was kind of funny to me coming out of COVID, but last year was a small year. Like, usually this number is quite bigger uh, than, than this as well. So, so we spend our money 
um, in ways uh, that are compassionate. And another, another thing that we do uh, to show compassion in our church is um, that, that we uh, participate in different community activities uh, to, to show compassion. So one is we, we host the food connections in our building. I've talked about that a few times. If, you're not, if you don't remember what that is, you don't know what that is. So the Food Connections program is a program where uh, uh, food that is going to otherwise go to waste from like restaurants or grocery stores is going to be tossed out, but is still uh, good enough to be able to be eaten, um, is, come, uh, is gathered, and then it's distributed out to families that are in need. And so if you go into our kitchen and you see all the boxes everywhere um, uh, and tables everywhere, that's set up for the Food Connections program every Tuesday come here. Um, they set things up. People come to our building. And so I love that, that fact that people come to our building to get that, like that, that it's showing the, the people that are in need that, that, that we're there willing to, to care and, and, and give to them. Now, that, the Food Connections program is not a BCF program. It's a CAP, the Community Assistance Program program. But many uh, people from BCF participate in that. Um, and like I say, we host it in our building. And so that's, one, that's a way that we show compassion in our community. Um, we, we partner with uh, the, the CAP uh, Coat Drive um, with Thanksgiving Baskets, um, with some of those, those programs that, that, that we partner with. Um, many of you in the congregation volunteer in different programs of CAP, such as the Clothing Bank and, uh, and, and uh, the Call Center and, and, and different things. There's, there's different ways you volunteer. If, if you feel kind of challenged that you would like to to step out and, 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 and live out this value of compassion more in your life. There's, uh, CAP can always use more volunteers. So you can talk to Dan, and, and he'll let you know um, ways that we can do that. That's another way I feel like, actually, that, that we, we have support Compassion Our Church is even the fact that Dan, one of our elders, um, gives a lot of his time to that, the, the CAP ministry as the president of CAP. And, um, and obviously, he's free to do what his time, whatever he want, wants. But, but him doing that takes away from time that he could be spending or, or, or doing stuff for the church. And I don't say that in a way that I'm upset about that because I think we're glad for what Dan's doing uh, be, because we love compassion, uh, because of, of our heart for that. We're glad that, that he spends his time that way. And so we support uh, Dan in that. Um, yeah, another, another huge thing that, that I, is, it was not at all like a program or initiative or anything like that, but just happened organically through the Holy Spirit working in different, the hearts of different families is, is um, the, our church's heart for fostering and, uh, and adoption. Um, this, the, the, did you realize that half of the children that attend BCF regularly come from foster and adoptive backgrounds? That's awesome. Like, we talk to friends that uh, like go to churches, you know, huge churches down in Seattle um, that, that are foster or adoptive families, and they say, yeah, we don't know another family that does that. And, and then this tiny little church, like even this, this morning, we have a small group this morning, um, but, but half the children here come from that background. And it's not just that the families support that, um, but, the, but the church is, is such a welcoming place for our children. The way that you guys as a church love our children. Oh, I can get teary up here. Um, is a meaningful way that, that we show compassion as a church, right? Um, even like things this morning, like when we had some extra kids that, that were maybe being a little bit of distraction, um, I never feel that pressure like, oh, the pastor's family's out of control or, or anything like that, that uh, but I just feel that love and support of the community. And so just thank you for all the ways that, that, that you show compassion. That's a huge one, obviously, that's, that's important to, to, to us personally, but I think is also a hallmark of our church. So those are all different ways um, that, that, that we show uh, compassion as a church. Um, and you may notice that there's one thing that I did not mention with that is uh, I did not mention uh, the gathering place. So, so Joe uh, shared a few months ago about the gathering place and his work as a chaplain um, that he does, and, and the church has been uh, supporting him uh, with that. Um, but there's been some changes, and so I'm going to invite Joe up actually to share for a minute about, uh, about the changes that are, that are coming up with the gathering place. Morning, church. Promise I won't drink your coffee, Justin. <laughs> uh, so, as many of you know, uh, the gathering place been operating for two years. One year as a nonprofit, and 
an additional year before we became a 501c3. And we've closed. Uh, you may have read in the Northern Light, I posted a letter about that. Um, so our bi biggest challenge has been finding uh, sustainable funding. Uh, we had funding, but always trying to you know, juggle and make decisions on needs. And it just became more and more difficult because needs in the community skyrocketed. And um, at the beginning, a lot of the needs were, as Justin was talking about, like people that needed someone to talk to or uh, someone that could listen to them and small needs. But now uh, we got inundated with asylum seekers, people with legitimate asylum claims that fled persecution in their countries. And unfortunately, our system is broken. Our immigration system's broken. There's no political appetite on either side of the aisle to do anything about it. And so people are left in limbo for quite a long time. And we just don't have the resources to help them through those long periods. So it's become really challenging. And I don't like saying no to people. And so we thought it best to, to wind things up. So we, we looked at grant money, but a lot of the grant money went to larger foundations and organizations. So then we tried to build bridges to them. And in four situations, we were looking to partner with community health groups. We got uh, positive feedback from them to do that. And then for whatever reason, that they didn't follow through with it. So at that point, uh, we were left with the challenges and without any concrete agreements, we decided to close, uh, voted to do so. Um, the office is closed now. I'm in there wrapping up the various reports and things that we need to do. And then at the end of it, the monies that we have in our account will be given to CAP, and that's by our bylaws that we agreed upon at the beginning. So we'd like to thank the BCF family for that. And also many of the cases I would call Justin and on some of those uh, BCF also shared the cost. At other times it was CAP, so we all worked together as a team. So Justin asked me to share some things over the last while that I've learned about compassion. So I'll offer these. Uh, and just talked about ongoing uh, uh, ways that when people face crisis, they realize they can't do it alone. So despite our society seeing faith and the church as less and less important, um, when people experience pain and crisis that's beyond their ability to solve those problems, um, that presents an opportunity for believers uh, to love and to serve. Uh, many times our love and service does not go unrecognized. And I can remember various ethnic groups that we assisted. And um, there were people in their own community, in their own tribe, if you will, that took advantage of them. And they said, but, you know, many times I heard it, but you are different. And so that provided an opportunity to um, explain our distinction and to share why we're different. And it's not because we're great people, it's because we love Jesus and we want to be like him. Um, as we show people compassion and need um, in their needs, uh, we help them to be compassionate to others and compassion can become contagious. And so, uh, one of the great ways to end this ministry was a couple of weeks ago, a refugee that we helped last year is doing well. He's got an apartment, a car, um, working many, many hours, working very hard. And he found out about a family that we recently helped, and they're in, the Canada, in Canada and now. And... Uh, he said, did you tell him about Jesus? And I was like, well, yeah, in between things. And he was like, I'm going to go tell him 
uh, and I'm going to go help them. So I got a picture with him and this family uh, breaking bread together, and it's great that people that we helped are now going on to help others. So I've learned in 38 years of Christian life that um, the more we recognize what God has done for us, the more we have the capacity to love, serve, and show compassion to others, and that in times of crisis, uh, although man wants to believe that they're self-reliant, uh, they see the truth of their helplessness, and that gives us a, an opportunity to share a glimpse of their need for Jesus. And when we allow ourselves to be um, inconvenienced and available, that's when I see God work the most. And it may sound blunt, but I believe that people that lack compassion are, an, they have an inward focus, they're selfish and ungrateful. But I do believe, as the scripture that Justin shared at the beginning of our service today, that one day every knee shall bow. And I do believe that one day we will all be humbled and come to know a realization of just how really blessed we are as people. Um, and it's God's plan for us to be people of compassion. And while we're not saved by works, and uh, I believe that true works come from a deep uh, indication of what faith has done in our lives. And we can show that compassion to others and show um, you know, just how appreciative we are to God through that. Um, and God responds with compassion to us. I saw undeniable miracles when I stepped out. And I, and I don't need Justin to remind me today. I know that I'm not special. You can do this, too. And that as you step out, God will use you. And God will work miracles. And you'll see unbelievable things happen. Um, because God lives in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. The New Testament teaches that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's in us. And if we step out, God will unleash his power. And so I'll leave you with this thought. It's um, one of my favorite scriptures. It's from uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, uh, um, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And I was talking to Justin about this word comfort and talking about how I wanted to look at the Greek on that and being a Greek scholar, and I'm not. Justin was able to share a little bit about just how rich this word is. And the, the, in the 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the word for comfort, um, Justin was explaining, is uh, the word that we get paraclete or parakletos. And it's the same word that Jesus used in the Gospel of John to describe the coming of the Holy Spirit, the comforter. Um, but as with many foreign languages, these words are very rich and they have many meanings. And so I took a look at the others and this word compassion is uh, an advocate, a helper. John uh, 14, 26, it indicates like a legal assistant going into the court to plead someone, someone's case before a judge, um, to teach or instruct to urge, to beseech, to implore, to exhort, to summon, and I love this one, to call to one side, mm -hmm. to encourage and strengthen by consolation. So my prayer for BCF today is that as we have been comforted by God, we will go out and share that comfort and love with others. Thank you.
Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of building off that, right? So we kind of said as we, we look at these values that we have, um, that we encourage us to, to look both as a church, how are we displaying that value, and then personally. Like, how are you displaying this value of compassion in your life? Um, and last time Joe spoke, spoke I, you know, I, I shared that, uh, as he, he alluded to, like, Joe's not special, he's just available, right? That is, we're available, that God uses us in all of those different ways. Uh, that I, I liked going through that, that, all those words for parakleo, that, that's, that was interesting to think of on and everything. I appreciate that, Joe. Um, and so, yeah, are you showing that compassion in your life? Are you willing to step out? Are you willing to be burdened and identify with someone else? Are you willing to meet their needs in ways that they may not be able to meet themselves? Are you working to show the grace of God that God has shown you to others, even to strangers around you? Are we, are you acting in compassion? Um, I just want to close uh, with this verse. This is uh, a verse I've, I've shared many times, um, but it's one of my favorite verses, I think, uh, in, in Scripture, because I think when it ta- comes to compassion, you know, we, can, we be, can become weary. There are many times I, I, uh, through the last couple of years with Joe that I talked to him, and I heard you, and I'm, I'm tired <laughs> like, uh, with all that he's doing, right? Um, identifying with people and their need can, can drain you. It can be very challenging. It can be very hard. It can be um, uh, wearying. Um, but, uh, and I think sometimes we use that as an excuse not to engage uh, in compassion. Um, or we, we feel like, am I really even making a difference? Like we invest in someone, we take a lot of time, a lot of energy, and then we see no change, no progress, um, nothing happen. Um, and, and this is a verse I always remind myself of that I come back to, that I uh, send to other people all the time. Is therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. When we truly get the heart of compassion, when we truly see compassion for what is as as a chief character of God, an extension of the grace that he's shown us that we extend out to others, when we really understand compassion for what is, it's different than than worldly. There's lots of nice compassion that, that do good things, but when we understand biblical perspective for all that compassion is, then we do not get weary in doing it because we recognize that that compassion, that yes, it's focused on the people receiving it, but in a sense, it's focused on God as well, right? It begins with God. And so so even when it's not received with the, the way we want, even when it doesn't have the effect that we hope that it has, even when it's tiring or wearying, we can say it is good. It is accomplishing something. It is showing a picture of God's kingdom here on earth. And even as we show compassion, even if it fails to have the impact or the effect that we would like it to have on those we are showing it to, it can have impact on us. It makes us more Christ-like. It helps us to be more in line with the heart of our God, who is a God of compassion. And so that's what I want us to reflect on as we go into communion today is the compassion that God showed us in giving us his son. And just to reflect on, are we displaying that compassion personally, uh, each one of us? So Steve, if you can come on up here. Um, And uh, Max, if you want to come up to hand out communion. You can go ahead and come on up and get your communion, take it back to your seat, and then we'll hold it and take it together in just a couple minutes.
Yahweh came down in a cloud and stood there with him. And he called out his name, Yahweh. And Yahweh passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of compassion and mercy. God, we thank you. We worship you as the God of compassion. The God who cares for us in ways that we are not able to care for ourselves. Who provides a salvation and purpose and love. We thank you that you came, that you identified with us in a way that cost you. We thank you for Jesus being willing to give up his own life on the cross for us. We take this bread and we say thank you for the compassion of God. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, may the grace and compassion shown to us make us more compassionate people. We thank you for the mercy and grace you showed to us in Christ, and we take this cup and we say thank you for that grace. And so, God, we ask for your help. Help make us more compassionate people. Help us see ways that we can really love others in ways that they are not, and care for others in ways that they are not able to care for themselves. God, tear down barriers in our minds and our hearts that keep us from being compassionate as you are compassionate. And just help us to love others well with the grace that was shown to us. God, we thank you for the many ways that that compassion is at work through BCF, and we pray for, for those to bear fruit for your kingdom, God. May they draw people to you. May people come to know you. May the compassion that we show have an impact and effect for your kingdom. And you help, may you help us to grow in compassion and to become more and more like you every day. God, I pray for any of us that are weary from compassion, that we would remember that in the Lord our labor is never in vain. Strengthen us and help us to live out this value of compassion as a church and as individuals. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Grace be with you all.